I'd like to greet you this morning in the same way our African brethren shared with us during the delegation session. That is to say, happy Sabbath. And the reply would be, happy day. And in return, we would say, happy day. And your response, happy day. And there's another phrase they share with us. The Lord is good and return all the time. All the time. All right. Now, shall we try once all together? And I'll say, happy Sabbath. Happy day. The Lord is good all the time. Very well. In behalf of the Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement General Conference and the Roanoke Church, I would like to welcome all 176 delegates who attended during the session who represent worldwide church membership over 38,000 and also 66,000 Sabbath school members around the world. And those who are attending over six. 2,600 worship places. And, uh, and also we have a lot of other participants of our online uh, worships and Sabbath schools. Also, I'd like to extend a special welcome to all our brethren, friends, and visitors who have traveled long distance across the Atlantic, Africa, Europe, across the Pacific, Australia, Asia, and Pacific Islands. And also we have South and Central America. I'd like to extend our hearty welcome to our viewers who are joining through the online live streaming this morning. Especially, I wanted to make sure all our brethren who cannot come here physically so they can share and join with us this morning. So if you would like to uh, greet them in the all together, we can say happy Sabbath to our online viewers. Can you do that? Happy Sabbath. When I meet someone who does not know about our church, I like to share with them the uniqueness of our Sabbath school. I emphasize the fact that the lesson will be published and studied in each locality around the world. And we learn and study every Sabbath and every morning. How? The same lesson. So when we come together, we can share same hope and same desire with uh, our friends and uh, members so that we can have same goal to hasten our Jesus soon coming. Please forgive me that I cannot greet you everyone's name one by one, but we welcome wholeheartedly uh, to the Sabbath school this morning. I'd like to uh, open the Sabbath school with our key text this morning from Proverbs chapter 8, verse 33. Proverbs 8, 33. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. May the Lord bless you through this Sabbath school. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Our opening hymn this morning is 157. Don't forget the Sabbath. 157.
Happy Sabbath, brethren. I would like to invite you all to kneel down, and I'm going to pray with you this morning. Our Father, which art in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath day you are giving us. Thank you for this, this opportunity we have to gather, to praise and worship thee this morning. Thank you for the freedom. Thank you for bringing each of us here safely. Now we ask the presence of the Holy Spirit and the protection of thy angels. And for all you have done for us, we praise thy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, brethren. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Amen. This morning we are going to review our lesson, the lesson we studied last Sabbath, listening without doubting. doubting. How can we listen without doubting? I think we all are surrounded sometimes by doubts. And the lesson the Lord has sent to us is teaching us how to listen to his voice without doubting. And I really enjoyed the text of the spirit prophecy that came with this lesson because actually it tells us that doubts, it's not always bad. I'd like to read again the text for, uh, to refresh our minds. It's a very interesting text. It says here, the doubts and fears against which we have been called to struggle are the precious trials of our faith. God's workmen that work out for us as far more exceeding in the eternal weight of glory. So, Brad, I think we all feel bad when we start having doubts, when we start doubting. We feel bad. But the text here is telling us that they are workmen of God work in your lives. But there's times when doubts come, assail us, and there's not much we can do about it. But just hold God's hand and wait until darkness is gone. But there are things that we cannot doubt, and that's what the lesson is talking to us here this morning. So when doubts come, for example, about the providence of God, the care of God in our lives, and we are surrounded by this darkness, what should we do? So the first stop tells us that in these moments we are supposed to trust in God, trust in the Lord, delight thyself in the Lord, commit thy way unto the Lord, and he'll take care of you. Uh, and there are questions that, comes, that come to our minds that we cannot answer, and this is normal. Also. We are not supposed to answer all questions that come to our minds or all questions that people ask us about God, why not? Because the Word of God says that the ways of the Lord are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we cannot completely comprehend the mind of God. Otherwise, He would not be God. If, we'd, if, we'd, if we could answer everything about Him, He would not be sovereign. So He would not, no longer be supreme. So we don't need to feel bad when we cannot answer all questions that come to our minds or that people ask us but we should always trust in God and direct the souls to Jesus and tell them when they ask us questions we cannot answer, tell them that God is supreme and we cannot know everything about him. But uh, we have to keep knowing God and searching to know God. And the second topic of the lesson tells us about wisdom, solutions for our doubts. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all you are getting get wisdom. So we have searched to know God the most we can. Uh, the second topic of our lesson, Monday's uh, topic, it still tells us what is necessary to find answers to the questions 
that we are supposed to understand, that we are supposed to find uh, answers, and that we are supposed to know how to answer to other people. And it says it's by faith. We need to have faith to find answers. We need to study the Word of God. The inspiration says, the study of the Word of God will enable us to do His work intelligently. Brethren, how different can our lives be if we have it as a practice to study the Word of God every day? Can you imagine what will happen in your life if every day before going to work or before going to study, you spend time reading the Word of God? Can we imagine what is going to happen if every day of the week we study the Word of God and then Sabbath morning we meet as brethren in church and we start talking about the Word of God because our minds are full of the Word of God? How different experience we can have if all the members of the church are studying the Word of God. And when we meet on Sabbath, we are talking about Jesus and about His Word. The third topic of the lesson, it advises us to be careful and uh, reject unbiblical traditions. There are many things we learn in our lives that we think is part of the gospel, we might think it's part of the true religion, and uh, the Holy Spirit comes to our hearts and tells us that these are traditions and we are supposed to let it go. And sometimes it can be hard to let traditions go because we have put them in our hearts, in our lives, as if they were part of the gospel and of religion. But the lesson comes to tell us to analyze and see what is really part of the gospel in our lives and what is just tradition. And warns us say, saying that we sometimes accept teachings of men for doctrines and as being commandments of God when in reality they are commandments of men. And it tells us that we have to be careful because if we get too attached to traditions, human traditions, then we lay aside the commandments of God and we hold to these traditions of men. And that's a mistake. That's an error. So that's why it says here, search the scriptures, for therein is the counsel of God, the voice of God is speaking to the souls. So the word of God, thus says the Lord, thus says the Bible. That's why it's important to keep studying the Bible and seeking to know God as the Bible presents him to us. And uh, when we place tradition in the place of God's commandment, then it says that our religious work can become even a, an abomination to God. I found it interesting when it says here, when fasting and prayers are practiced in self-justifying spirit, they are abominable to God. So if we pray, if we fast, but having it as a penance to save us, or having it to justify ourselves, to self-justify ourselves, then it becomes an abomination to God. I, I really was surprised when in the third chapter of Great Controversy, I found the spirit prophecy saying that the devil one day came and he introduced fasting on the Sabbath day. So he introduced fasting during the Sabbath, and on Sunday, they were partying, and people were very happy on Sunday, and people self, uh, was, were fasting on Sabbath as a means of self-justification. So what happens when you uh, fast for self-justification on the Sabbath day? Then you, you may become uh, nervous. You may have a, your face showing that you are sad, that you are tired. You have no disposition to, to do go, good, good works on the Sabbath for others. Then you feel as the Sabbath is a weight on your back. And you are sad, impatient during the Sabbath, and it becomes an abomination to the Lord. And that's what the devil said, did. He said, you know, these people, they are confusing fasting, so I introduced fasting during the Sabbath day. So they fast on the Sabbath. It's a miserable day for them. And Sunday, it's a party day. Everybody happy. The children will be happy. The young people will be happy. Then it will be easy to switch it. People will appreciate more Sunday than Sabbath. That was also what he did. So we have to be careful. If you uh, have pleasure in fasting during the Sabbath, fasting makes you to be 
uh, more willing to receive the word of God, makes you to have a better communion with the Lord and with the brethren church, if it makes you happier and ready to receive the word of God with more disposition, then fast. But if it's a weight for you, if it makes you feel miserable in the Sabbath day fasting, don't do it on the Sabbath. If you still feel it, you need to do it somehow, do it some other day. If it makes you not to feel pleasure on the day of the Lord and you have communion with the brethren, with your family, with your children. Uh, Wednesday's lesson talks about personal conviction, a protection against doubt. So brethren, as I said, I think we all face doubts sometimes. Once a while, thoughts will come to our mind and makes us doubt and question things about our religion, question things about God. So I think we all face it one time or another and sometimes during our, our Christian journey. But personal conviction is a protection against doubt. And what is this personal conviction? It's a personal uh, relationship with Christ. When you look and you see what Christ has done in your life, when you remember what he has done for you, then it makes it easier for you to go through and overcome doubts. I'll share with you one experience that has made a difference in my life. I, uh, the Lord has showed some evidence in my life that he exists. And I grabbed on this experience with the Lord. And when doubts come, I remember them and I say, you know, the Lord is good, the Lord exists. I cannot doubt. I was in Ukraine one time. Brought the brand of Ukraine, they, they never heard of this experience, but I'll share with you now. I was in Ukraine for some days. I, I had spent two weeks there, and uh, we had a youth convention. We had a good time. But I, have been, I had been out of home for, the, uh, for Christmas. I had been out of my uh, home for uh, the beginning of the year, the New Year's. And, uh, you know, I still have something of my Catholic background, and we join being together as family uh, on Christmas, on New Year's. So it's a tradition that we like. But I was far from my family for that uh, end of the year, and my wife's birthday is in January 6th. I was not home. So when the work finished in Ukraine, I was ready to come back to, come back to Canada. And I, I was happy to be there with the brethren, but now I was happy to go back home, and I wanted to be with my family. So we arrived early in the morning, around 6.30 in the morning in the airport, and it was snowing very heavy, very heavily. And uh, the flight was supposed to leave at 8 in the morning, and they did not start checking when it was 8 in the morning. We were still there, and the uh, heating system in the airport was broken that morning, so my feet started uh, freezing. It was really hard. <laughs> Sister Dina is there from Ukraine. They remember Brother Victor took me to the airport. And we were there, my feet started freezing, and I, I could not be sitting. I had to be walking and exercising because it was getting really cold. And uh, so the, the plane didn't leave. And they came and they said, you know, the plane cannot leave. Leave, the weather is too bad. We'll come back at 9 o'clock and let you know if anything changed. 9 o'clock they came and they said, you know, it's the same. We'll come back 10 o'clock and give you some more information. 10 o'clock they came. It was still snowing heavy. And they said, you know, we'll come 11 o'clock and tell you if anything changed. They said, but if things don't, don't change until 2 o'clock, then uh, we'll have to cancel the flight. But the problem, Bradley, was that I had bought this ticket separated from uh, Chernovitsy to, uh, to the capital, Kiev. Uh, it was another ticket going from Kiev to Germany and from Germany to Canada. So if I would lo uh, lose that flight, miss that first flight, uh, I would lose, uh, miss also the flight uh, to, if that flight would not leave, I would miss the flight from Kiev to Germany and from Germany to Canada. And I had looked, they had no tickets available anymore. I looked and I saw they had no tickets available anymore for 10 days. Unless I want to pay a very high price to come on executive class and I could not afford it. So when they came, and they came 10.30, and they said, you know, the weather is the same thing. Uh, there's no chance. So I, I realized my flight would leave 1.30 in the afternoon from Kiev. I said, if this flight doesn't leave until 11 o'clock, I'm going to miss the flight from Germany. And uh, it gave me kind of a despair. I have to be here 10 days away from my family. When my work has finished here, I don't have anything else to do. So I went outside, and I looked. And the sky was all dark and snowing heavy. I said, no way, this flight is going to leave until 11 o'clock. 
But I said, there is just the one chance, and that's the only chance. So I went inside the airport, I looked for a place, and I prayed to God. And I, made a play, uh, I prayed like a child. I opened my heart to the Lord, and I said, Father, I know I have disappointed you so many times, but uh, I need you now. Please do not disappoint me now. Find a way. I know you can do it. I know you can do it, Father. So please, find a way for this plane to leave until 11 o'clock. I prayed to God. When I prayed to him, he answered my prayer, but in a nice way, because he brought calm to my heart. And I was in such a peace after praying that I said, you know, I'm ready, Father, for your answer, be it yes or no. But brethren, that was a miracle, the peace that he gave me. But when he starts doing his work, sometimes, you know, we, we th we think he, he doesn't care, but he does care for small things. For him. That for us seems to be so big, for him it's small. But a few minutes later, the person from the airport came and said, we are going to start checking, and their plane is going to leave soon. Brandon, when the person announced it, I felt, I, I desired to cry. I, I feel like crying. It was something special going through my body. And, and I, I felt ashamed at the same time. I said, Lord, I... I did not even deserve to ask you this favor. And now you, you answer it. It just humiliates more because I, I feel if, uh, it was a contradicting feeling in my body. I didn't know. I was so happy, so thankful. But at the same time, I was ashamed of asking it from God. But in his mercy, he made me feel like a child of his. And I was so happy. And pray, till today, I praise the Lord for this miracle. So, Brian, of course, sometimes even today, Doubts come to my mind. But when doubts come, I remember experience like this one. And I, I say, you know, God is great. And he's in control. Doesn't matter what we go through, he's in control. So, Brian, that's uh, what the Lord talks about, personal experience with him. Convictions that he brings to our hearts because we have experienced him. So the danger for us is to forget what God has done in our lives. I want to read with you a text that's not in the lesson for this morning, but it's a beautiful one. It says, when temptation assail you, when care, perplexity, and darkness seem to surround your soul, look to the place where you last saw the light. So there are times you are not going to be able to see the light. Doubts are going to take over. But then the Spirit says, look to the place where you last saw the light. That's personal conviction. It will bring you personal conviction. Rest in Christ's love and under his protecting care. When sin struggles with mastery in the heart, when guilt oppresses the soul and burdens the conscience, when unbelief clouds the mind, remember that Christ's grace is sufficient to subdue sin and banish the darkness. Now, I would like to talk with the young people here. Actually, the Lord is talking to you this morning through a text from the lesson here. And I would like you to really pay attention to this message God has for you today. It says here, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Our youth should be presented with a pledge to sign that they will not touch idle tales but that they will make diligent search of the scriptures. So the Spirit is saying here that we should make a, a, a pledge for the youth to sign. I, do, I, I, I have not prepared this pledge, but I want you to sign this pledge in your heart, saying here that you are not going to touch idle tales, but that we, sp we spend this time that so many young people are spending in the world with idle tales. You know, well, Idol Tales it was talking more here about magazines. They were reading books that had tales that they were reading. But I want to tell you about TV today, about movies, that sometimes we are tempted to spend three, four hours in one day watching movies. The inspiration says, you know, sign a pledge in your heart. You are not going to do it, to listen to these tales. But this time you are going to save it to spend with Jesus, with his word, listening to the word of God. Can you imagine? the spiritual power you are going to gain from it, of reading the Word of God a couple of hours every day. I am so amazed to see that, you know, uh, I'm not that young anymore, so sometimes I take longer to get acquainted with technology. But uh, some time ago, my children showed me that we have the Bible in one app that you can listen to it. And I was so amazed about it for me. I was so happy. 
You know, I had been planning to uh, read the book of Proverbs a couple times in a row, and now I discovered I can listen to the book of Proverbs, and it takes just, a, you know, a few minutes every day, and in one week you listen to all the book of Proverbs. And I was so happy to, to find out that. So you have the Bible in your cell phones today. So listen to it. Download this app and listen to the Word of God. When you are tempted to be watching, spending long time watching moves, let that small voice of the Holy Spirit talk to you and listen to it without doubting because he'll come and he'll say, you know, it's time for you to talk to the Lord and spend time with me. So may the Lord bless all of us that we may find in Jesus our, the solution for our needs and that uh, our conviction, our experience with Jesus may give us the strength we need to continue going forward until one day we meet with him and go and live with him forever in a world much better than this one. May the Lord bless all of you. Amen. Well, this morning we will be going through the lesson for the day, and uh, as you've seen the lesson title, it's, and as we've prayed, it's entitled, A History of Listening to God. Now, uh, the thing about history, it's recorded for what purpose? What do you think we record history for? That we might learn the lessons, yeah? That we might learn the lessons from history. So. I'd like to see this morning uh, what lesson that we can learn from uh, the history of God communicating to us and mankind listening to God. And, uh, you know, for me, what I got is an overall impression from the lesson. Number one is the um, intense desire of God to want to communicate with us. And secondly, the, uh, the tendency for mankind, rather than listen, he refuses to listen to God. And, uh, but, but this does not, in spite of that refusal, God has continu continually sought to communicate with us that he might restore us to that uh, relationship with him that he so much wants for us. So uh, let's have a look here through the lesson, and, and it's brought out there in that uh, key verse. Um, John, you want to read that, the key verse there? With the mic, John. Uh, yeah. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 33. Be instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Thank you. So here, instruction is the command here, to hear what God has to say to us and don't refuse it. So let's have a look at how this was uh, manifested throughout history, coming through to uh, Sunday's uh, lesson. Firstly, we have here the experience of Adam and Eve. Now, what was significant about the communication between God, the Father, and our first parents before sin? Significant. Anyone have that, Dora? Yeah. Well, it, is, it was... Um it was a great privilege, first of all, they, uh, they could communicate with the Father, with their Creator. And um, this was on a daily basis, as it says in the note, face-to-face, heart-to-heart communication with his Maker was Adam's high privilege. Had he remained loyal to God, all this would have been his forever. Right. We, we can't even imagine, this is beyond our, uh, beyond our imagination, how a privilege that was, you know, mm -hmm. to communicate mm -hmm. with God, to, to, to see His face, to, uh, to see His love, His care mm -hmm. in, in, in all of these uh, things. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, th that was a, a great honor mm -hmm. for our first parents. Amen. And so then after sin, what happened? What was the change after sin in that communication uh, method or process? Instead of God the Father Himself, what happened? Uh, yes. First of yeah. all, there was communication. Yeah. God communicated yeah. to his fallen children. Mm -hmm. He didn't uh, break up communication with them. Mm -hmm. And then I see uh, two uh, p different perspectives. 
There is one dark and sad perspective ending at the grave, but there is also a happy and light perspective that shows us the way um, of salvation and eternal life. Mm -hmm. And who was that that communicated? We see there in Genesis 3.8. Um, what did Adam and Eve hear? Uh, after they sinned, obviously, but what did they hear? They heard what in the, in the garden? John? They heard the voice of God the, walking in the garden. Now, when you see the, in the scripture, voice of God, what does that indicate to you? Who is voice, the voice of God? Who is that? What else do we call the voice of God? The Word. It's Jesus Christ. The, the Word? It, yeah, the yeah. Son of God, Son yes? Of God, yeah. The Son of God now walking. So God now sends the Son to communicate to Adam and Eve. All right. So the Son comes walking in the cool of the day to communicate to them. And uh, communicating to them effectively the plan of redemption. That's really what it was about here. And uh, after sin now, so what other method of divine, or what divine guidance they receive? Uh, this, and uh, this may have stumped some people, but Genesis 3, 16 to 19, there were some points that we can gather from here as a, as a, um, a method of communication with, so that would teach Adam and Eve some lessons they needed to learn. So what did God do after, uh, or, or say to them after the fall? He gave them... Uh, Yes. Of, yeah. Yeah. yeah, pretty. Uh, yeah. For, to Adam, he said, in the sweat of your brow, you're going to eat bread. So you're going to have to work hard now yeah. after sin. And to me, the other interesting thing is about Eve. She was not submissive to her husband. So the Lord told her in childhood, in child rearing or childbirth, you're going to have a hard time. And this is going to remind you, you know, of your sin and also to remind you that I love you and I, I'm going to give you another son or child That's right. yeah. that will remind you of your Redeemer. So even in the sorrow, God teaches us lessons through the sorrow and pain and suffering, lessons of restoration and redemption. Thank you. Well, this, the sorrow and the pain came uh, to man and to the woman in the both um, areas or the both uh, points which are most important for them. For a wife, uh, getting a child uh, normally is the biggest joy and uh, is the fulfillment of her life. And in that, okay, in that point, to, g to get a child, to bring a child to the world, there was the danger now and the pain and uh, much pain. And for the man, normally his work, his profession, is his fulfillment. And uh, in that point, he was punished because now the earth refuses to give its fruits mm -hmm. and he has much pain. There are ma many thorns and thistles. Mm -hmm. And in that very earth that refuses its fruits, he will find at the end his grave in that cursed earth. Mm -hmm. but, after the, but the plan of redemption indicates that after the grave comes the what? Yeah, that's the, a, the, the light the, perspective. Yeah, the, yeah. the resurrection, yeah? Yeah. yeah? And this is the wonderful yeah. hope, isn't it? So, and I'm reminded also in the hard work that uh, the problem is with uh, Sodom, for example, was idleness, right. yeah? And so work was given as a blessing. So all these things, even though there was a curse attached, it still had a blessing in it that would teach them uh, something of the plan of salvation, something that would help develop their characters, preparing them once more for rest restored communion with God. So this is, uh, this is what I get from that second part of the lesson there on, on Monday, on Sunday rather. Let's go on to Monday. Um, we have here now experiences here with Noah and Abraham. Uh, firstly, looking at Noah, um, what did you get out of this? Uh, let's ask Brother, here, Brother Fithoff, what did you get out of this? Well, for me it was interesting that in all these four chapters, Genesis 6 to uh, Genesis 9, it's a long story, and in all this long story, Noah is not speaking one single word. Yeah, that's uh, so. Uh, uh, there is no word that the Bible tells us what Noah spoke. So he's he, only listening. Yeah. He is obeying. He is yeah. acting, but he is not uh, speaking. He's a big listener. Big listener. Good listener. That, I think that's a lesson for us, isn't it? That Noah was a great listener because you no, not one word spoken, I thought that was very significant, not one word spoken by Noah in all those passages, simply listening to God. Yeah, Brother John, what, what did you get from that? Yeah. Uh, I, I saw that Noah was a very good listener. Yeah. And he paid close attention to God's instruction. Mm -hmm. 
therefore he is able to build a very complex ship sure yep. with the measurement and height and wide yep so how yep. he can balance the ship during the big waves absolutely also. so he was able to uh, listen and hear the instruction and and, and let him to be able to build the ark yep. as well as uh, simply trust and obey god uh, yep. exp implicitly isn't it Paul, yeah. yeah another way that impressed me the way he listened to god is he put all the money he had all his life possession into building that boat mm. you know and what what if if there if if the flood never came he would have spent all his money but he had faith that god would do it and so he sacrificed everything and so mm. listening to god will always involve some kind of a financial sacrifice yes and i'm reminded too that uh, his listening to God was in spite of the voices of the great multitude. Right. Everyone else was saying, basically, You're crazy. Uh, yeah, accusing him of uh, of madness and and, and uh, you know fanaticism mm -hmm. because of what he was doing. And mm -hmm. uh, but in spite of all that, he continued on in this path of simply listening to God, obeying that voice. And I think it's a lesson there for us, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. In, in spite of whatever voices are around us, around us. It, to discern mm -hmm. God's voice, to to listen. And to obey. Um, let's get. Let's come down now to uh, Abraham. Abraham, what did you get? Go on. Yeah. Well, this is uh, Abraham is called the father of uh, the faithful ones, right? Yeah. So uh, the lesson what I I take from this question is when God approached Abraham, the Bible says that he approached him personally. Mm -hmm. So it was a direct contact. It was not publicly. It was not in, uh, you know, God said Abraham, and he responded. He was listening. So um, it's a huge lesson for us because he can, and he does in the same way in our days mm -hmm. as he did in those days to Abraham. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what was Abraham's response? He was not waiting. He was not, uh, you know, questioning it, his response was, yes, Lord, I'm going to do. And he rose up. So it's a, a huge mm -hmm. lesson for us. It is. Also, um, we see also in Abraham's experience, okay, we have in, in Adam and Eve, we had the Son of God communicating with them, but then we see, um, we hear the voice of God communicating to, to uh, Noah. But now with Abraham, I think it, it wasn't brought out in the lesson itself, but you'll know from, if you've done a bit of extra study and reading, Genesis 18, we have a Something interesting about uh, Abraham, when God wanted to communicate to him, you know what was brought out there, Genesis 18? Oh, the angels, exactly, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this comes from the previous yeah. sections. He brought up the angels as a way of communication, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was after the fall. Yeah. They would communicate, and, uh, right. and we have the Abraham as well. Yeah, yep, exactly. And, really and yes. Um, you know, sometimes listening to God involves doing something very painful. And he had asked God to reveal Christ to, in his day. And the way God answered that question is in asking him to sacrifice his own son so yeah. he could experience it. But that, that was a very painful thing to do. And he could have said, you know what? God said, thou shalt not kill. Why would God ask me to transgress his commandment and kill my son? But faith went forward and he just went ahead and obeyed uh, despite... Yeah. Absolutely, the, absolutely. Yes. I think that's uh, another way that God communicates. May, if it's not, okay, he may tell us to do something, but in the doing, there's a lesson. There's actually a lesson in the uh, doing of what God asks us to do. It's not just the lesson to do what God says, but the lesson, there's a lesson itself in, in the doing. And with, in Abraham's case, as you've mentioned, God wanted to teach him something deeper about the plan of redemption. Exactly. And, uh, and he did, he learned that lesson which was that what the cost would be involved in God giving up his only begotten son uh, to die for us. Amen. And uh, I, I, see, I see too, um, in that experience, when you compare to Hebrews 11 and what Abraham was able to count God able, able to do, when he offered up the son, you remember he said to the three men who would help, he says, uh, um, Wait here, and I and the lad will go and worship and come, back. come again to you. I and the lad, not just myself, but I and the lad will come, will go and come. 
And so that sort of indicated that he had what? What, what sort of idea did he have? Even if he offered up his son, what would God do? He could resurrect him. Absolutely. Yeah. A wonderful lesson of the resurrection truth. Yeah. Well, we learned that Abraham didn't understand everything. When Isaac asked him what will happen, he, he couldn't explain the whole story, but he knew one thing, one thing he knew, and that was most important. And he said, God will provide. God knows, God will help, he will care for us, he will see. He is a Yahweh Yirach, Yahweh Jirach, the God who cares, the God who provides, and Amen. he is caring for us as well. Amen. Amen. Can you imagine if Abraham had not obeyed God's voice at that point, mm -hmm. what tremendous lessons would have been lost to us, to all mm -hmm. of hum hum humankind? Lessons on faith, lessons on the plan of redemption, mm -hmm. on the resurrection. All these things would have been lost. So just through this one uh, man's example, so many precious lessons have been left for us. And this is a, a lesson in itself of, of, of obeying God. So I thought that was really, really significant. So looking at, um, let's go over now to... Uh, uh, Tuesday, and now we're here, we have um, experiences of, in history of Moses and Aaron. All right, I thought this was interesting. I, f I found here for myself, I don't know about you, but a, 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 a new way that God communicated, and that was not just a voice, but fire. Fire. A, a fire. fire, but not just any fire, it was a burning bush. A fire that was not, the bush was not consumed. So this was an epiphany of, of where God reveals himself to Moses, uh, rather, yeah, to Moses uh, in such a way, and I like, I was impressed by the notes said there, if you look under the paragraph two there, of the note under A, it says this, halfway through the paragraph, this impression was never effaced from Moses. It was the first time in his life that God revealed himself to him. Mm -hmm. You know, we have other examples where God revealed himself to Noah. No, it's under 3A, three, three second paragraph, halfway through. Um, this impression was never effaced from him. So for the rest of his experience, all those 40 years of wandering, wilderness wandering, and dealing with the children of Israel and ever, right through the end of his life, that impression of that day when God appeared in the burning bush, never left his mind. Mm -hmm. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was Pretty also an object, les an object lesson, because that bush was not a beautiful a green bush, a bush with flowers or a palm tree, but we have to imagine that it was a bush in a desert. So it was a very poor and simple bush, maybe a bush with thorns also. Mm. And Jesus. Uh, disguised himself in that poor, simple bush. Mm. That's his humility. Mm. And we also can discover in this bush the thorn crown. Mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. beautiful. Amen. So in something so simple, uh, so insignificant as a, burn, as a bush, uh, God hides himself, isn't Amen. it? Amen. And, and, and uh, there's a wonderful lesson there for us wonderful. in simplicity. Yeah. yeah. So, something else here, if we follow the Bible and we look, the way how God communicated with Moses at first hand in the wilderness, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then we look later in the future, we see Elijah, the fire came down from heaven. And, um, and, and then we see that Elijah was taken to heaven in a, in a chariot of fire. Mm -hmm. So the way how God communicates, you know, how he led them through the wilderness uh, during the day in the pillar of uh, a cloud and during the night in the pillar of fire. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that, that that was a kind of manifestation of the power of God, how he would communicate with his people as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Looking um, later, so, so we have the burning bush experience, which is now impressed on, on Moses' mind. It's never going to leave him. And that began a wonderful relationship between Moses and God. You know, and, and, and that relationship came to a point, and you see there in the second uh, part of this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, point, under point B of this uh, mm -hmm. question, what did it eventually lead Moses to be able to, to, to say? Mm -hmm. What did Moses ask of God? Mm -hmm. Remember? J John? Yeah. He requested God to show him his glory. Can you imagine? 
Uh, was that presumption on Moses' part? In here, the Review and Herald, May 11, 1897, mm. reading from the second paragraph. Yes, yes. Think you that God reproved Moses for his presumption? No, indeed. Moses did not make this request for idle curiosity. He had an object in view. He showed that in his own strength, he could not do the work of God acceptably. He knew that if he could obtain a clear view of the glory of God, he would be able to go forward in his important mission, not in his own strength, but in the strength of the Lord God Almighty. Yeah, so Amen. it wasn't presumption at all. It was simply a desire to have assurance. Yeah, would you say that? An assurance from God that would uh, keep him in good stead that he might go in the strength of God, not in his own. So just have this assurance that God will be with him. And he asks, show me your glory. And uh, I thought that was amazing. And, and the, the, um, the previous note also brought out, though, that this was almost like a relationship of a friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, friend to friend. Mm -hmm. yeah, friend to friend. And I, I think that was significant, that Moses had such a close walk with God that he could commune with God as friend to friend. Mm -hmm. And, yeah? Okay. Uh, I was just thinking, why did Moses require this specific request, show me thy glory? Why he didn't ask him something else, you know, at this moment when they were communicating? And I'm thinking this involves as well the plan of salvation, mm -hmm. because he heard from his parents and grand grandparents and so forth what our first parents in the Garden of Eden have lost. Mm -hmm. When we remember Adam and Eve were covered with the glory of God, right? Mm -hmm. And when they have sinned, they lost that glory. Mm -hmm. So Moses was, curi was, was not just curious, Moses was in fire in a way to know what they have lost and where he should look for mm. what they should obtain again, the glory of God. And that Amen, was... amen, absolutely. And we see too here now with Aaron, okay, examples here of Aaron, uh, uh, how did God speak with Aaron? Well, we know here God also speaks directly with Aaron as well, yeah? But not in a, perhaps in a, in a more direct way, or in the most direct way as he did with um, Abraham, but, oh, sorry, with uh, Moses, but he speaks to him uh, still directly, and he uses Moses to speak with him as well, yeah? Okay? So, uh, as it says, Exodus 8, verse 5, the Lord spake unto Moses to speak unto Aaron. So he uses Moses to speak to Aaron, and then later on, in Leviticus 10 there, it brings out that he then spoke to Aaron directly. It says there, uh, the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, and, uh, and uh, he was, uh, when he heard that uh, voice, um, he obeyed. He obeyed, yeah. So moving on now to Wednesday, let's have a look here. Now we have an experience of God speaking to Israel uh, through, or rather, through um, a most significant way. Okay, it wasn't through, uh, he had been speaking through Moses, but now something happened. Something was about, he wanted to uh, make an impression upon their minds <laughs> that they would never, ever forget. And there was a reason behind it. So firstly, what way did God use to communicate to Israel on Mount Sinai? Well, yeah. well, again, we see that the voice of God or God speaks to them directly. Mm -hmm. So on the Mount of Sinai, He speaks to them directly. They couldn't see His face because they just heard thunders and lightning. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the way how He communicated. I would like to relate this uh, aspect when God is going to announce the day and the hour of Christ's second coming. Mm -hmm. It's in the same way. God is going to speak. And to people, this is going to be like thunders and lightning. Mm -hmm. So the same way he's going to use at the end, uh, at the end of, end of time. Thanks. It's well, Matt, I might put, put this one to the congregation. What, what do you feel? Anyone there would like to um, give a response on this? If we were there at Mount Sinai, what effect would that have upon you? seeing God or hearing God, seeing the uh, lightning and the thunders and, or hearing the thunder, seeing the lightning in the, in the sky there above the mountain and knowing that God was present there 
in person on that mountain. What effect would that have had upon the congregation, do you think? Anyone here would like to answer that? Yes, uh, brother, brother Craig there, I think it is. If I can just highlight that, the, the, um, they were fearing him, yeah? They were f- afraid of, of being what? What were they afraid of? Being destroyed. destroyed. So we, um, for us, what, do, how do we respond? How would we respond ourselves? What do you think? Yes, of course, it was uh, absolutely impressing and it caused also fear. Yeah. And I guess it was uh, the climax of the experience of Israel, this, uh, ex- uh, this event on this mountain. Mm-hmm. But uh, it couldn't be repeated and it couldn't be improved. But centuries later, it was repeated and improved when we see Jesus again on a mountain Mm -hmm. explaining the law. That's Mm. the Sermon of the Mount. So we have one mount here, one mountain, and Mm -hmm. on that mountain comes the law, and later we see Jesus directly, personally, again on another mountain and explaining the law to Israel. And so that was uh, type and anti-type of it. And then we see Jesus on another mountain together with Moses and Elia. And so the, we can see that it is not an antithesis between Moses and Jesus, as many Christians uh, interpret it, but uh, they are uh, close together in yes. a harmony. Yes. So the law is combining New Testament and Old Testament. Yeah. What, Jesus on yeah. the mountain. And, and if uh, the congregation might want to look here under question 4a, Three things were given here, if you note, three things were given as reasons why God actually uh, physically manifested himself on that mount. He was now going to speak directly with his covenant people, the words of the covenant, and it would leave behind or teach them three things about his law. And you'll see the three things brought out here. Did you see what they were? Yep, yep. Yep. John, you got the three things there? Yep. The three things are sacredness of the law, the importance, and the preeminence of his law. Thank you. The sacredness, the importance, and the permanence of his law. These were the three things that we, he wanted to impress upon the minds of the people. And that was... The first time that he manifested himself to his covenant-keeping people, and it wasn't until 1,500 years later, as you said, when Jesus came, uh, the the Son of God came, and there on the mount, in a mirror almost of of, uh, that experience, but now in in where the glory is veiled by humanity so that people can now bear to see him and not fear his presence, he now gives them the Beatitudes, the the, the Sermon on the Mount of Blessing, and the principles of that law exemplified. Yes? We read that Moses went to the darkness that uh, was hiding the Lord. And we know from the Bible that God is dwelling in a light, Mm -hmm. in a big light where no man can go, Mm -hmm. but he is also uh, covered by darkness. Mm. So we have a song, holy, 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 and we sing, though darkness hide thee. Mm. So uh, he is also hiding himself Mm. Uh, from men, man's eyes into darkness. Mm. Mm. And I think too, uh, there, was a, there was two words. When the, the people, okay, God hid himself in that darkness, but still, there on the mount, that would have been, a, a, well, the noises and the, and the actual visible displays there struck fear in their hearts, as was mentioned by the, the, uh, Brother Craig there in the audience. But w- what... And they were scared that he was going to, they were going to die. But then what did Moses say? Brother Doran, what did Moses say? Well, two, two words, the first yeah. two words of Moses to them. Be not afraid. Fe- fear, yeah. not. Fear, yeah. Not. Yeah. fear not. Fear not. Yeah. Fear not. Fear yeah. not. Fear not. So this, is, uh, this, is, this was his reply, basically, and it's very uh, related to what Christ said. He calmed the sea and he said, fear not as well. Yeah. So he was... Uh, he was calming. Yeah, anyway. yeah. I think it was the, 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 the spirit of Christ coming through, wasn't it? In the That's attitude right. of Christ to the people. Okay, the law is there, but fear not. Mm-hmm. Fear not. Mm-hmm. Why? Mm-hmm. 
because the lawgiver is also mm -hmm. the redeemer, mm -hmm. the one able to save. Yes, this is the law, this is, its, this is how sacred it is, this is how important it is, and this is how permanent it is, mm -hmm. but I, give, I bring mercy with that mm -hmm. law, M mercy to save. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, just a little. I was yeah. also going to say that um, when, you know, God's voice was like thunder, and it thundered, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and that inspired fear. And it says that sin should inspire fear and guilt in us. Absolutely. But then when we fear and have the guilt, then God says, fear not. Yeah. Yes. And I'm and I reminded, wherever there is sin, what? Grace abounds. That, well, where, where, yeah. yeah. But wherever there is sin, there is the Savior. Savior. Yes. And so as the people became conscious of their guilt, the same one who was making them conscious of the guilt was also their savior, yes. right? So wherever there is sin, which is the law points out sin, and the lawgiver there pointing out sin, he was also their savior. And we've got to remember that lesson. Whenever mm -hmm. we feel a conscious sense of our guilt, we've got to realize that Christ is there, pres ever present to save. And that's, uh, that's also important for us to, to, to grasp hold of by faith, that lesson. Um, Okay, so now, through the centuries between the Mount Sinai and Calvary, how does God communicate now to Israel? Through what other method do you use? Thorin? He has used the method to the prophets. The prophets, yeah. So he has chosen male and females as his prophets, yeah. and he communi communicated his word to the prophets, and they sent the message to the people. That was the way of communication. Exactly. So the, um, and the way that that was uh, working out here, too, the... Uh, what, I, what I was impressed with was uh, the types and symbols, um, nature itself, as well as um, uh, the uh, messages that the prophets brought in the written word. Yes, brother. Yes. Uh, nature is a general revelation, but we need also a special revelation by the word of God. Mm -hmm. So nature is able to uh, prepare the heart of a person to, uh, to discover that there must be a creator. Uh, all the beauty of nature can, uh, uh, can prepare man and can speak to his heart, mm. but it gives not enough information about God and salvation. Mm. So we need to this general revelation, the special revelation by the prophets, uh, mm. by the uh, Bible. Mm. Mm. And so when you think about nature though, we had a whole lesson on that. Remember, mm -hmm. if we go back and, you, and those who've got the lesson pamphlet, you remember uh, lesson number three for the whole quarter was uh, nature speaks you know, of God's glory. Okay? It, was, it was a whole lesson on na nature speaks to us of God. A whole lesson on that. And what's significant about the voice of nature? Something significant about the voice of nature that uh, transcends the experience of the Tower of Babel. What happened at the Tower of Babel? What happened to the, in terms of communication, what happened at the Tower of Babel? It was lost. Huh? Yeah. Communication yeah. was broken. Yeah, communication between uh, mankind themselves was confused, confounded. But the one voice that was not confounded was the voice of nature. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's All right. right. Yeah, and we learn in that lesson that, uh, what was it say, the heavens declare the glory of God. The glory of God on the earth shows his handiwork. And yeah. uh, the language of nature is a universal language. Yeah. Everybody can understand it. Yeah. There are other uh, universal languages. For example, music is a universal yes. language. Yes. It touches every heart and yes. so does the beauty of nature. Yes. And animals and flowers. Yes. yes. But sadly, um, nature, while it's a universal language, sadly, however, not everybody interprets it correctly. Yeah. And that leads us to uh, the last, this last uh, section here, a, a Thursday section now, looking at how does God then, despite the universal language of nature and its lessons, how did God uh, communicate with us now? How does he want to communicate with us? What does he use to communicate? Someone? Through his son. Through his son? Jesus Christ. Yep, through Jesus Christ. And where do we read about Jesus Christ? In the scriptures. In the scriptures, In the scriptures isn't it? And that's what it says, yeah? Hebrews 1 verse 2, uh, there hath, God has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. son. Yeah, by the son. And, uh, and Jesus said to do what? In John 5, 39, what's it say there? Jesus said 
to those who were, who were uh, searching. He said to what? Search the scripture. Search the scripture because they speak of me. Yeah. They reveal my, my, uh, myself. Yeah, absolutely. So they reveal to us of Jesus, who we want to be a friend, isn't it? We want to have a personal experience with him. Yes? Yeah, I have a note here, uh, a question for all our audience. What are some experiences in your life where you heard the voice of God speaking to you most loudly? Um, I don't know if, if you, we have a few minutes to get the audience to respond. Do we, well, Brother we, Paul? We don't. Have we a don't. Few, no, we don't. Sorry. But okay, but anyway. <laughs> Maybe you could give us an experience. I though. will give an experience. To me, Just, the way God spoke most loudly is through loss, when I lost my husband, through losing someone be dearly loved. And it brought to my mind the verse, how God spoke his love to us most loudly in John 3:16. Yes. When he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you. So through that suffering, that God the Father is speaking to each one of us. He wants us to have eternal life with him and spend eternity with him. Amen. And this is where it comes into what kind of experience does God want us to have. I think it's a personal experience. Yep. Yeah? personal experience that uh, where we, as it says there in, in uh, Jeremiah, or Psalm 34 verse 8, as well as um, Jeremiah, uh, we are to taste and see what? The that the Lord is, is good. good. Can I taste for you? No. no. Uh, yeah? Tasting and seeing is very individual. So when I want to see how is America, I have to go to America myself. I cannot only read or look in the television, but I have to experience a, a voyage, a journey. Yeah. And so um, I have to taste myself. Absolutely. And this is a diligent Bible study. If I want to taste, then I have to study slowly and diligent and to think it over and to make it a part of my thinking, of my life. Yeah. Only then I have a tasting experience. If I read very uh, superficially, then I, cannot, I, I won't taste anything. No, that's right. It's like someone who, who uh, drinks, uh, yes. dr dr drinks a drink in, uh, in, one, in five uh, seconds minute, flat yes. or yes, something yes, and yes, without yes, tasting yes. it, you know. But this is, and this is what it is. But to do that, as you mentioned, it's something that's, that requires deep study and research to spend time doing that. And that's what Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me, how? With all your heart. Yeah. Yep, with all your heart, yeah. Correct, and this is the kind of searching. You know, just in the, in the last uh, couple of minutes, what I wanted to highlight here, something that also was, uh, I was impressed with was coming back to the Word of God, the reason why God gives us His Word is, is I mentioned it, but the note brings this out as well, uh, that um, while nature speaks to us of our Creator, yet because of our fallen human nature, the uh, weakened powers and restricted visions, the note here brings out that we are incapable of interpreting it right, and so we have the revelation of the Word. But that's not a universal voice yet. We have in this world, uh, I did some research here, we have 6,909 languages as, as of 2009. 6,909 languages. The Word of God, or a portion of the Word of God, has been translated into 2,508 different languages. So there's still 4,401 uh, 4, languages, which is yet to be, yet to even under, read what God's Word, John 3.16. That's right. You know, and yet this message is to go where? What was the third angel's message, to go to where? To every tongue, nation, and kindred. So isn't that a wonderful work, opportunity there for someone, isn't there? It's a work to do. We need translators, brothers and sisters. We need translators to translate the, the, the message and the word into all these other languages. And, but, but, you know, the disciples faced the same difficulty, but the God resolved that difficulty with the Holy Spirit pouring out upon us. So just in summary here, um, I think it just, just in highlighting this lesson, uh, for me, is, it, it's, as I said in the beginning, God's tremendous desire to communicate with us through all the different methods He can use and uh, us to, to 
respond accordingly, like Noah did, like Abraham, like Moses. So may all of us have this experience uh, in, our, in our own personal life that we might taste and see that the Lord is indeed good. Thank you. Thanks. Amen. This time we invite the congregation to unite our voices together, singing him the theme song found in the back of your program to finish the Sabbath school.
Shall we all reverently kneel down, all those who are willing and able? Thank you. Holy and righteous Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful time of worship. We thank you for thy words. We thank you for the messages through the music and the songs. We thank thee for the servants appointed to share the bread of life this morning. Thou would continue helping us the words that we received, the voice that we hear from thee. Find place in our heart that it will find fruit. We also pray thee that would continue, continue helping us in the rest of the days that is before us. Everything that we do today may bring glory to thee. We pray for our young people, the children, the grandchildren, that they all may be able to grow in grace, to be a wonderful friend of Jesus. Help them, Heavenly Father, that they may be growing up to be the pillar of thy church. And we also pray that thou would bless the families which are represented here. Thou would also bless the friends and visitors here, that they may be supplied with the heavenly blessing according to their need. We also thank thee for the willing heart for the children of thine. They were cheerfully giving for thy cause. Bless the gifts and the offerings that is received. May this go and used for thy cause. Thou would also bless others who have the willingness to give but unable to give now. Thou would also continue helping each one of us to love thee and serve thee. Accept our prayer and supplication. Forgive our sins and shortcomings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 